Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great day. Uh, I am Lana Michaels, the Education and Program Manager at the Museum of Sonoma County. And welcome to this discussion of the museum's exhibition, Agency, Feminist Art and Power, presented in collaboration with the Feminist Art Project and curated by Karen M. Goodfriend. Before we get started, um, I want to acknowledge the land on which our museum is situated, which is the lands of the Pomo, Wapo, and Federated Indians of Great and Rancheria. We honor their history and their culture. Um, agency, Feminist Art and Power is made possible through major funding from the National Endowment for the Arts, Community Foundation, Sonoma County, and Diane and Jack Steppen. We thank them for their generous support. I also want to thank Karen and all the artists who have taken time out of their very busy schedule to be with us today. And I would like to introduce Karen Goodfriend, who is the curator and will be monitor monitoring today's program. Karen um, is both an independent curator and an artist with a focus on feminist and social justice art. She has worked in the painting and sculpture department for MoMA, um, as well as the Pacific Art League and as an art consultant to both corporations and individuals. She also served on the board of the Women's Caucus for the Art and was the National Exhibitions Director for the Women's Caucus for the Art for Art for six years. Um, so we, we thank her for all the great work she's done at the Museum of Sonoma County. Uh, and I will pass off the baton uh, to her now. Oh, um, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing, <laughs> Karen. <laughs> um, in today's program, if you have any questions, um, you'll see below at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can chat questions to us. And at the end, we'll have a Q&A um, with Karen and with all of the artists. Um, so feel free to leave your questions there at the bottom. All right, thank you. Well, thank you. So should I kick it off or may I first introduce uh, Connie Tell, who was a collaborator with me on this exhibition as representing the Feminist Art Project. So uh, Connie, would you say a few words? Yes, I'd be delighted. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Connie Tell. I am the uh, National Chair of the Feminist Art Project and uh, co, I guess, collaborator on this, uh, presenting this exhibition with the museum and with Karen, the curator. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here, especially to be able to see the artists. We didn't get to have an opening yet, a reception yet, so I'm really excited to hear what everyone has to say. And um, thank you so much for your work and contributing to this to this amazing exhibition. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Connie. And for people who are in the Northern California area, we will be having an artist reception on Saturday, April 9th. So if you are anywhere close, please come by. And so um, agency brings together the work of a wide spectrum of artists representing diverse cultural backgrounds, genders, gender identities, generations, and geographic locations. Uh, these feminist artists challenge the cultural political norms and seek to smash the patriarchy. They investigate com uh, <clears throat> excuse me, topics of empowerment, identity, gender roles, aging, gender fluidity, reproductive choice, women and work, violence, and more. They take a direct and unapologetic approach to exploring difficult issues, cultural conversations, political debates, and historical contexts that dominate today's headlines through their lenses and individual perceptions. So what is agency? Agency is the capacity to act or exert one's own power, to act independently, and to make free choices. This is the underlying premise of our exhibition, Agency Feminist Art and Power. And so now let's talk with the artists. First up is Winnie Vanderine. Hi, Karen. Hi. <laughs> so I have a question for you is, so how did your Dismantle the Patriarchy project come about? So it came about kind of in four steps. I was doing a residency at the Textile Art Center in Brooklyn. So I was immersed in textile art at the time. Um, second, I had a daughter graduating college and I looked to her going into the world and I thought to myself, oh no, 
Have we made it any better? What is she going to be facing? Um, the third thing that was happening was that it was a time when there was a whole bunch of false news. Like that was the new norm that there were um, invented, invented um, truths uh, being, being put out into the world. And the fourth thing was I was, let's say, enjoying menopause. And several people had started to call me sir. And it bothered me. And then I thought, I don't know why that bothers me. And I thought to myself, is menopause unwomaning me? Has the world decided I'm now unwoman? And if I'm unwoman, am I then man? And if I'm then man, do I now have access to the power of an upper middle class, middle aged white man? And if I do, what am I going to do with it? So obviously, I decided because of these four things that I would be tearing down the patriarchy through an iterative intervention into menswear. So that's how the project came to be. Yeah, no, I love that. And, you know, definitely want to remind everyone when we talk about smashing the patriarchy, it's not just the old man's white club that we're used to. It's also patriarchy represents any group that is trying to marginalize and minimize the voices of others. So with that, tell me, so how many shirts have you dis dismembered or <laughs> uh, and why so many shirts? So my goal is to intervene in a hundred shirts. My idea around creating so many or uncreating so many is to show that there's an infinite possibility of, of alternate ideas besides the patriarchy, that I don't have the one answer. What I'm trying to do is offer up the idea that there's infinite, infinite ways to take it down and infinite other systems or mixed systems that we could have. I have um, this week completed 86 of the 100. Oh, congratulations. And I can't wait to put all 100 together in, in a solo show. Sounds good. Well, all right, thank you, Winnie. And next up, we have Rosemary Meza Desplas. So, uh, Rosemary, tell us what is the connection between your visual artwork and your spoken word performances? Okay, Karen. Uh, well, my poetry and my visual artwork are aligned by the social political issues that they both address. And so writing is kind of a window into my artistic process. A poem could be a signpost for a specific artwork, or it could co correlate to an entire series of artworks. And then eventually the poetry morphs and shifts into stage spoken word performances. Yeah, that's excellent. And I know that you'll be doing a performance at the opening on April 9th. And I know we're so looking forward to seeing that. And tell us, what, what do you have coming up next? What are you well, working on? Sorry. What are you working on? I'm currently working on a series. It's called Miss Nalgas USA 2022. And Nalgas is buttocks in Spanish. And it's a, a multidisciplinary series of works that will include um, the fiber work, the hair works, but also video and art performance. And it's centered upon actually a um, beauty contest that I made up, which is Miss Nalgas USA 2022. And it's for those self-identifying Latina women over 50. And it's inspired by Arlene Davila's book called Latinos Inc., which is the marketing and making of a people. And in it, she talks about the commodification of ethnicity and the idea of, of there being a right way to be ethnic. And so I'm inspired by that for the series. Oh, that sounds fascinating. I can't wait to see it. And for those who may not know, if you can see uh, Rosemary's piece up in the corner is this is made completely with embroidered hair, with her own hair. And, and it's, 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 just, it's stunning. But anyway, thank you so much, Rosemary. And I look forward to seeing you in April. Thank you. So next, uh, Priscilla Otani. And with your work, 
So we have the title of your work is Shedding Femininity. And I wanted to have you explain what that means in context with this piece. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so let's face it. On Instagram and TikTok, even today, young women are seduced into building a feminine persona based on a perfect face and a bodacious body. And despite economic opportunities for women now, and they become certain, they, they join pre previously male professions, such as engineering, legal depart, legal areas, doctors, professional athletes, et cetera, they're still subjected to various microaggressions by, by men. They're still subjected to lower pay um, in their workplace. And on the other hand, women who work in traditional gender roles, such as mothers, caretakers, teachers, um, cleaners, all of those women are too often discounted in their professions and not you know, respected for what they do. So this work represents um, women unzipping themselves from gender roles and stereotypes and stepping forward as who they are, proud, effective, contributing members of society. Uh, no, I think that it's an awesome piece. And so you have a very exciting project coming up, which also you're we're gonna you're gonna put in the comment line for people to get involved. But tell us about this your feminist project. Okay, so I started a new mail art project that's gonna be part of my solo exhibition that's gonna be happening in September. And it's called I Do Believe. And it's about the subject of abortion. Um, as everybody knows, the subject of Roe versus Wade is gonna be argued in court this year. And I wanted to put together a dialogue of postcards from people who are in all the spectrums of beliefs on abortion. People who are right to lifers, people who are uh, choice people, people who are in between. And I've put out a call for everybody in the United States and in the world to send me postcards about their beliefs. That's why it's called I Do Believe. And I will put into the comment section the link for more information about this. But all the postcards I received by June 30th will be sewn onto, onto a cloak, a black cloak worn by a large woman mannequin. And the postcards will be exhibited that way at the, in the gallery. And there will also be uh, postcards available for the students who are going to be seeing this, this work to add their, their beliefs. So I feel very happy about this. And I do want this to be a dialogue. So I hope everybody in the audience will contribute a postcard for this. Yeah, thank you. I know I would contribute one for sure. Thanks, Priscilla. And now we have Martha Wilson. And my question, my first question for Martha is how does age relate to agency? Oh gosh, sorry, let's go back. Uh, Martha, can we put you on hold for two seconds? Cause I forgot. Sure had one that I needed to read. Can we go back to Judy Gallus's? Thanks. So I'm reading on behalf of the estate for Judy Gallus. She is an amazing artist that I've worked with on many shows. And unfortunately, um, she passed away in 2020. Um, and this piece is, You Look Better When You're Smiling, is such a, a key feminist piece. And her uh, estate gave me this to read is, my collaboration with family members follows the evolution of someone who has survived traditional female expectations. Beginning with the series, Family 1977 to 82, I documented the daily life in an artist as a young mother alongside my two sons and husband. Autobiographical, gosh, I can't talk. Autobiographical stories were used to depict subtle ways we were taught to be male and female in our culture. Mm. And that, mm. So again, my question for Martha is how does age uh, relate to agency? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a story about a work that I just created, uh, but it starts 50 years ago when I uh, was in graduate school in English literature, but I was hanging out across the street at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, where I heard about Bruce Nauman's video called Bouncing Balls. 
I don't know if you're familiar with it, but he's bouncing his balls, his <laughs> bacon balls. So I decided to do a feminist version. So I uh, did an eight millimeter film bouncing my boobs. Uh, then I moved to New York in 1974 and film got lost. So then uh, I had made it in 1973 and I turned 73 years old and I decided to remake this piece as a 73 year old lady. And I explained that uh, I, as I'm bouncing my balls, it's a video of, of my chest where I'm bouncing my boobs up and down. Um, I explained that um, it's, it's going to be less alluring now that I'm 73 years old, but uh, so it goes. Basically, we're all gonna die. Yeah, I, I would love, I'd love to, if the first film wasn't lost, to have been able to see like the old one, <laughs> the new one, and like with his yeah. little corner, yeah. great. Well, I know you're the founder of the Franklin Furness. Can you tell, the, tell our audience what the uh, Franklin Furness does? We present time-based art, and we've been doing this for 45 years. Time-based could be, it could be an artist book, it could be a poster on the street, it could be uh, a video, it could be an audio uh, tape, it could be a, a temporary exhibition, it could be a street action. Uh, these are all the works that were being created by the community downtown uh, in 1976 that the Uptown Museum and Gallery system was ignoring. Uh, pretty soon they, the galleries figured out that temporary installation was a way to make a, a saleable environment to sell the prints out of the back. So mm -hmm. temporary installation and now even performance art is being collected by museums. So it was a it was a um, an early effort to validate the kinds of practice that we'll call it the postmodern generation was creating in the seventies. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Martha. And next we have um, Jesse Edelstein. And Jesse, I want to ask you, how does your work, um, how your work relates to queer identity rather than feminism? Um, sorry. Um, yeah, I guess I was going to say, um, as one of the younger people in this show, I grew up kind of under different parameters than a lot of um, other people, I guess. And I just find that like when I do my work, I don't think about feminism or the fact that like I'm a woman at all. In fact, I find that a bit like reductive to just sort of say that. To me, my work is pretty much about um, like my own personal autonomy, my own queerness and technology and how those things combine in order to kind of enhance my self-expression. Yeah, no, thank you. I love that perspective. And Tell us about the current um, music project you're working on. So I'm currently working on a music project. Um, it's called Jesse MP3 and it's all unreleased right now, but it's kind of a performance visual lip sync project. And it's about um, my experiences with social media, kind of growing up on the internet and with social media and how that has affected me and my identity. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to see it when it comes out. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have Rhea Brodell. And my first question for Rhea is, how many pieces of the Butch Heroes have you done? Hi, Karen. Um, I just finished number 38. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> So that's so many because I know it's like, tell us how much research like hours usually goes into each one because I know it's like they're so incredibly researched and documented. Tell us a little bit about your research process. Um, yeah, each one, it depends on if I, you know, need help with translation or accessing uh, paywalls or different um, archives. Uh, so it all depends on the sources that I have around me. So it takes anywhere from about a month to eight months, I would say is the longest one. And that's without the painting process, it's just the research process. Yeah, well, what one are you working on right now? 
Right now, I just finished one. Um, so I'm actually currently in the research process, like looking for the new person to, to portray. Um, I just finished up writing the story or summarizing the story for the person that I finished. It was um, Joe Monahan, who was a cowboy rancher from Idaho in the 1800s. So kind of local to me. I grew up in Idaho, so it was a fun mm -hmm. one to do. Oh, I bet. And I know we have your um, your first book for sale in the museum um, gift store and in, in the galleries also. Uh, you, you're working on a new book also, aren't you? Yeah, it's uh, through, the second one will be through MIT Press as well. And um, it's going to have 15 additional paintings, an essay by a fellow trans artist, and probably an interview. And I think it should be out fall 2024 or fall 2025. So plugging away. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't wait to see that. And also to let everyone know late um, in June, we're going to be doing uh, the museum, Rhea and I are going to do, we're going to do a program, actually, it'll be in person where we will be uh, reading the stories of the Butch Heroes. And so I'm so looking forward to doing that with you. Yeah, same. Thank you, Karen. All right. Thank you. And next, um, we have Sally Edelstein. Um, and so we know the title of your work is How Old is Old? So how old is old? I, first, I just quickly have to say something to Martha because I, I have to disagree. I think your 70 year old bouncing boobs might be more attractive than you think. So I just, <laughs> I, I just, I need to say that because that is the response to how old is old. Like, um, so here's the deal. Like our yardstick keeps changing all the time. How old is old? Like suddenly, you know, 40 is the new 30 and 50 is the new 60 or, you know, whatever, like or 60 is the new 50. And the, what, the one defining thing that seems to keep continuing is that, you know, aging is still sort of seen as a decline and, and diminishment, especially for women, especially women who really become marginalized as they age and they become invisible. So that's how old is old and that we need to keep redefining that. Yeah, no, and I know because you came of age during the, like the second wave feminism and so tell us a bit about that in like your recent article in Ms. Right. So, I mean, here's, here's the interesting thing. So next month or the end of this month, I'm gonna be 67. And according to the media, I have reached my expiration date. I, you know, I, 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 I'm perishable, I'm done, like that's it. Like I just a few months ago had my first profile in Ms. And as a woman who came of age in the second wave of the feminist, it, it was particularly meaningful. Like, so coming to age in that time, I really became aware, not just of gender inequality, but how our images got fragmented, how women's identities constantly get changed and fragmented. And so that started to inform a lot of my work and I became interested in that fragmentation, like how it was presented in the media. Like, Right, and I know with your, uh, tell us about your process because so often you see so many things that are, are photoshopped and not to throw shade on Photoshop because that is definitely a skill, but yours is not that. So tell us about the images and your process. Right, so I, I mean, I, my work is collage, it's all hand cut and most of these things, some of them are almost eight feet long and they're all hand cut images and I use a little exacto knife, a little knife. I actually use a, uh, a jeweler's mining loop to put over my head. And um, each thing is glued and each thing is kind of outlined. And, and I tell a story, there's, there's many stories within each collage and I'm a collector. So I have collected what I kind of consider a femorabilia, a, a, a history of women over the past century of all the material. And I use that in the collages. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. And next, I'm, uh, Vanessa Filey was not able to join us today, but I'm reading for her. And so with her Me Too series, she said, the making of these images was a way to find connection within the experience of sexual assault and to be a bond in the aftermath of violation. We carry the experience of abuse in our muscles, nerves, and bones 
so much that it may impact generations to come. The process of making this work became one of building community, of sharing stories and holding space for trauma. I'm grateful to all the women who chose to be a part of this project and for the parts of themselves they shared with me. And right now we just have three images on the screen for her, but she has done, um, she has like 30 of these portraits that are just so stunningly beautiful. So thank you to Vanessa. Um, next we have uh, Delilah Montoya. And within this work, when you step into the museum, it's, it's 30 feet long and it's just so powerful. I love it. Um, there's so many different uh, symbolism within there with Lilith and La Lorena and um, which are cautionary tales. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the, you know, the hidden figures and the, the meanings of, of the objects that are in this work? I think you might, Delilah, you're still on mute. Better? Yes, perfect. Yeah, okay, good. You know, I um, I started this work uh, thinking about malcriadas and, and that is like you know, another way of saying bad girls or um, bad women. Um, and I was, I was really thinking about women of the folklore tradition who are presented as, um, women that you don't want to be, right? The monstrous women. Oh. And um, La Llorona is uh, the crier. Uh, and she she kind of shows up in, in Latin America as, uh, as a baby snatcher. And uh, of course, Lilith is also um, considered to be a baby snatcher. And she's a uh, pre-Bible. Um, she comes from um, Babylonia. And so what I wanted to do was to kind of demonstrate uh, syncretism between uh, Native American culture and, uh, and uh, what do they would call uh, old world cultures, right? And how when these two cultures came together, they clashed and they formed something, something new. Um, and so La Llorona, because La Llorona is kind of like an offshoot of the sixth omen of the Aztecs, right? But you also see a lot of referencing in her from, um, from Lilith as well. So she's, she's kind of like syncretic and Latin American people are the syncretic people of um, kind of a joining of like many worlds together. And so, you know, those, you know, that's the underpinning of this. The other thing is, is I'm trying, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, how, you know, so-called bad women, what they do is they try to like demonstrate how to kind of like hold a, uh, a population down. And so what I was trying to do with this is like, you know, what makes a bad woman? Well, because she has knowledge, right? She knows herself, you know, and so all of these things kind of came to the forefront. Yeah, yeah it's a beautiful, intense piece. And um, tell Thank us, what, what are, what's your next project? What are you working on now? Well, right now I just uh, completed a project for um, for a show in Denver, Colorado. That's uh, that deals with um, uh, Malinche or Malinai, and uh, she's another woman that is kind of considered to be a bad girl. But on the other hand, she's also understood as being like the first Christian of the New World as well. And, oh wow. uh, and so what I, she, and basically she was um, Cortez's tongue. She was his, uh, his uh, interpreter. But what made her very interesting was that she was a slave, right? So she didn't have any choice as to, because she just kept getting passed on from one uh, culture to another. And as she was passed on from the Nahuas to the Mayans, and then finally she was passed on to the Spaniards, she learned all the languages. So she was a linguist. Wow. And, and she is the one that brought the two cultures together because she interpreted everything that was being said. She kind of intuitively picked up Spanish. Nobody had ever heard Spanish and she figured it out, uh -huh. right? The thing that made her really interesting to me was is that she was a woman who was a slave who was not to 
ever, ever look at any, any man's face, any of her master's face. She couldn't look at their faces, yet everybody was looking at her. Wow. That's yeah. yeah, she's she was amazing. But you know, the thing is, is with Malinche, nobody knows for sure what her name was. They don't know when she was born. They don't even know when she died. Right. And very little was ever recorded about her. She shows up in, in the codices. And so in many ways, she was like a vessel. Everything got kind of dumped into her and poured back out of her. And, and even to this day, there's all these interpretations of who she was, but uh -huh. yet so little is actually really known about her. Yeah. Well, I really look forward to seeing this project. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And um, next we have um, Kat DeBlano. And my question, we have four of your videos in the show and and so often it's like you use humor to get your point across and wanted you to talk about your work and the importance of using humor to make a point sure well um i mean this the this all started when i was in a residency in miami and i noticed so many women getting plastic surgery and it was making me mad sad whatever but more than anything, I needed to create a video piece to express what I was feeling. And I realized if, I'm, if I want my audience to actually pay attention to my message, I should try humor. By using humor, they'll actually like listen to what I'm trying to say, you know? And it wasn't that hard to do to find humor in, you know, our absurd beauty standards. I mean, if, if you were an alien and you came down to earth and saw what we were doing to our bodies, you might find it very, bizarre so truly bizarre yeah. and tell us about the time piece because it's so that one it's so funny but it's so true so tell us the thinking behind that one well it is an actual photo from 1933 that was at my husband's parents house and I would look at this and it's all white men but behind them was a clock so I started visualizing this clock ticking moving and for me that said like you know, time, time keeps moving, right? But everything else stays the same. So I feel like we haven't, we haven't really moved forward while time just keeps. I know, I think that's one of the, like the strongest messages, you know, uh, and so on point for this exhibition is just like, when are things going to change? You know, and so I really thank you for your work. And you also have um, I wish we had more time to talk about this one, but like your uh, series called Voices that brings yes. life all the, the voices of people that have suffered from domestic violence. Right, which is not, I don't use humor at all. <laughs> oh, no <laughs> humor, heartbreaking, but it's so important. But anyway, I, I just really thank you for your work. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Um, and next we have Shauna Adelman. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Hi. And so uh, people may not know this, our exhibition actually, oh gosh, it got pushed back twice because of COVID. And when we started, it was uh, going to be celebrating the 100 years of women having the right to vote. So I want to ask you first, um, is what are your thoughts on agency and voting? So I, I was thinking about this question because uh, Jeff Nathanson had uh, referenced it in the introduction to the catalog uh, that uh, it, the, the centenary that it was supposed to be on the centenary and voting the relationship, obviously, between voting and agency, voting as a critical tool of agency. It's also a, a tool that can be used to silence others. So in the aftermath of the 2016 election and, and then the March on Washington, the historic March on Washington, um, the Women's March, uh, and then the 20, and then the last election, the Pew Research stats on, on the vote was that 55% of white women continued, voted for Trump the second time. So um, it's, it's a worrisome trend and it uh, suggests that, you know, that, that 
agency is also, it cuts both ways. So in, in, if women are, 55% of white women are voting for Trump, they're voting for a misogynist and they're voting against the best interests of women. So um, anyway, that, that's what I was thinking of vis-a-vis -vis this issue of voting. Right, yeah, absolutely. And so tell us with your work, it's, it's just stunningly beautiful with just the entire canvas is covered in crystals. Tell us about your crystal method. And like, cause people always ask, how do you do it? Like with tweezers, like to, to just quickly describe how you, what your process is. So it starts with an archive of images. I have an archive of, of photos. Some of them are my photos and they, they come from all sorts of places and they're, the composites are created on the computer printed out in large format and then uh and then i apply the the crystal meth yeah uh, somebody referred to it as crystal meth i thought that was a sort of an interesting <laughs> yeah so it's just on the knees it's very labor intensive they're four millimeter colored bocconi crystals uh, the large ones have a hundred thousand or more crystals on them take a, a, a long time to make yeah yeah, no, certainly. And I know with this in piece, it doesn't have like the iPad behind it, but with some of your works, I love how there's the eyes will follow you and the mouth will move. And, you know, that's a really interesting thing that you've incorporated into some of your works. Yeah. The, yeah. Some of them have that time based element. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. And um, next we have uh, Christine Mays. And um, for those who may not have seen it, please, I encourage you to go to the museum website under the exhibitions because Christine and I got to have a, a Zoom panel talk just the two of us. And, um, and it really goes in depth into your work and your process. But my question for you today is, tell me, what you think about like being a humanist versus a feminist and the intersectionality? Um, I think that I, I would consider myself more of a womanist than, than a feminist, uh, mostly because um, the definitions around, the, around this, um, a womanist really is committed to the wholeness of an entire people and which would include race, uh, gender, class. And so it, it addresses things that are often left out of the feminist conversation, like with regard to um, the, the way in which this country has dealt with systemic racism and um, some of the struggles that are a result of that, that affect uh, not only black people, but also other people of color and, and, uh, and other people who are dealing with um, how they relate to the world with regard to their gender. So um, it just feels more inclusive. And so that's why I, I refer to myself as a womanist. Yeah, no, I, that's right on. And tell, uh, tell us about the, this, uh, this piece and Say Her Name and the importance for you. Say Her Name was birthed out of the idea it was birthed out of the reaction to black women being being killed in, in uh, by the police in large numbers. And so their stories often go, um, they not only go unreported oftentimes in mainstream media, but um, these people just essentially become um, invisible on some level. And so uh, while agency is a hard thing to harness in a situation like this. Uh, I've decided to use uh, the Say Her Name movement as a way in which to sound the alarm and to make the invisible visible once again. And so um, I just wanted to use, to create this piece in order to give voice to what's happening in this country. Yeah, thank you, it's really important. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Thank you. Um, and next we have uh, Nancy Yodelman. And my first question for you is, 
tell us about your very first uh, feminist art class and how it influenced your work and decision to become an artist. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, it was in 1970 and it was at Fresno State College, which was totally unexpected place to have a feminist art class, but Judy Chicago was te teaching there. Her name was Judy Garowitz. She hadn't changed it to Chicago yet, but what she did is it was the most incredible class. It was a year long class. We found and rented our own studio off campus. We um, she taught us how to build a 40 foot wall, carry sheet rock. She had us get work boots. She had us practice saying our name, both the first and last name and shaking hands and looking people in the eye. And this was 1970. And believe it or not, things weren't done like that. Also, she encouraged us to do, it was a type of consciousness raising where we talked about our innermost feelings, past experience. Out of that, I made the conscious choice that like I kept thinking, how would my artwork be different from a man's choice? And for me, it was the materials. So I started using clothing and sewing stuff and buttons and straight pins. And um, so my choice of materials really came out of that class. Also, I went from Fresno State College to CalArts where there was an official feminist art program with Miriam Shapiro and Judy Chicago. And we worked on a project called Woman House that was done and opened in February, 1972, 50 years ago. Right now there's an exhibit in Los Angeles commemorating it. And also my next project, I've been hired to go to New Mexico for seven weeks and supervise um, like a revisiting of Woman House. A house has been donated, it's for New Mexico artists and, and it's for men and women or all for all genders. So um, it's quite exciting. That'll open June 18th. Also, I've, <laughs> I've just, I'm a, obsessed with kitchen utensils. So these are like a spatula, this is a stir thing, wrapping them with pearl necklaces. I have hundreds of per old pearl necklaces and I wanna make about a hundred of these. These will hang at various things. So that's what I'm working on in my studio. And then with the project in New Mexico, um, I'm excited about that. Yeah, so we'll, I, didn't, I lived in New Mexico, I'd wanna come. Or can I oh, just- Well, this will be in Berlin. It's 30 miles south of Albuquerque. It's actually where okay. Judy Chicago is. It was through the flower who's presenting it. That's her, Judy's foundation. And they hired me to facilitate the project. That, that is excellent. That's so exciting. I can't wait to like, hear more about it. It is, thank and, you. Yeah, so quick question. Actually, I think you did address, it's like how you're you know, using the materials because it was so different from like traditional art materials that men were using at the time, which is what you've incorporated into your beautiful wrapped objects that, and, and or the pin gloves, which are just so stunning. Yes, well, pins are traditionally never used for the final project. It's, my mother worked for a seamstress. I used to sew all my own clothes. You know, I always use straight pins just to pin things together temporarily. Mm -hmm. but I've used thousands and thousands of pins to um, put in the fabric because it makes like, it looks beaded, it looks decorative, it looks shiny, mm -hmm. but it's also kind of sharp and I used to have bloody fingers. I used to have to. Oh, I bet. Tape, but I finally learned how to do it without stabbing myself. But I used to tape all my fingers with masking tape. To, oh my! To my that no shot. Just anyway. <laughs> well, thank you, Nancy. And oh, you're welcome. Next, we have uh, Margie Ware who actually was not able to be with us uh, today, but she sent me a statement to read. And this actually in the museum, it's a vinyl piece that's on the floor. So, um, but this is, you know, the images housed, you know, to be able to show it to you. Um, so with her, her title is Right to Vote. And this is what Marty has to say. 
is John Lewis, the centennial of women's suffrage, and my great grandmother were all inspirations for this piece. My great grandmother was a blue stocking suffragette. I remember her trying to explain to me how important voting rights for women were. She had worked for voting rights at a time when many women could not inherit property from their fathers, much less have a voice of their own. She was very proud of the hard fought women's suffrage. During the summer of COVID 2020 the, and the civil unrest caused by the death of George Floyd, I spent a lot of time watching MSNBC while I was in quarantine. John Lewis continued to work for and march for equal voting rights for all. His steadfast work over 60 years of it, creating good trouble in an effort to improve voting rights for all was so moving. And a little bit about her process is in making her vinyl piece, she works on a computer in Photoshop I gather these images together from sketchbooks that I scan or images that I find. I think my compositions are the digital versions of creating a collage. So her images become a dance between creating pattern and collage. Once it's finished, she sends it to another program with a vinyl cutter and it translates into a vector image that the machine cuts into rolls of vinyl. Then she has to pull the negative space vinyl by hand and then installing it is another problem altogether. And she said, Karen can speak to having that, having installed her work more than a few times. So yeah, let me tell you, her work is amazing. I love it. I'll do it again in a second, but like installing any one piece takes probably like five hours at least for each one, but it's, it's truly a labor of love. Um, so next we have Holly ballard Martz. And my first question for you is behind the piece is tell us about the wall color and the bit of history that ties into the title of the piece and the problem with glorifying the past. Right. So the wall color is a reference to William Morris, who is the founder of the British Arts and Crafts Movement, which was a rebellion against the industrialization of the Victorian era, era and was a return to the craftsmanship of the Middle Ages. And Morris is famous for his textile designs, particularly his wallpapers and his intense blues and greens that he was able to feature in them, which was rather new at the time because these pigments were derived from arsenic and his family actually owned an arsenic mine. So while these pigments were used to enrich the homes um, and home design and revolutionize the art world, they were also indiscriminately poisoning the affluent Victorian families who could afford to have the wallpaper in their homes and also the impoverished factory workers at the same time. And so this bit of history ties into the color that's in the background of my installation, that deep teal, this idea of the danger of nostalgia that is anytime you're glorifying the past, it's problematic because the good old days were really only good for a select few. That is so true. And so you've said that the bending of these wires and how many have you done to date? Um, close to 600 of them. Wow. So the bending of the wires is an exercise of endurance for your hands that mirrors our slow, painful trudge for full reproductive rights in the U.S. And so tell me about like sort of the taboo of like having the symbol of the coat hanger in this work that's sort of like the taboo is hidden in plain sight. Right, so um, the coat hanger is a symbol of the desperate measures that people will take when they don't have access to safe and legal abortion. And so I, I have one of the hangers here. I don't know if people can see it at all, but um, so it's the bottom of the coat hanger. It's six different pieces that are soldered together and then powder coated, but transforming them into this wallpaper, it, it disguises this idea of that this is the female reproductive system and that it's this measure that people will take when they're desperate because abortion doesn't stop when it's not available, when there aren't safe and legal means to it. It doesn't stop. It's always, always happened and will continue to happen. So it may be hidden from view, but it's really there in plain sight. It's always happening. So that's the relationship between those two things. Yeah, thank you. I think it's such a gorgeous work and it's so important. And as you said before, it's like nothing is going to change unless we can have these difficult conversations. And so I really applaud you for, you know, for doing this. Thanks, Karen. Thanks. 
And next we have Sawyer Rose. And so tell us Sawyer, why is it important for everyone to learn about gender work inequity? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> um, so the thing is women do more unpaid domestic labor than men in every single country in the world. And so that means, you know, cooking, cleaning, childcare, but also elder care, volunteerism, all of these responsibilities still default mostly to women. And the this imbalance of unpaid labor has knock-on effects in career advancement, representation in higher paying fields, representation in male dominated industries and so on and so on. So, you know, as an artist, I was, uh, I wanted to explore these imbalances by looking through an intersectional lens at the many different ways that female identifying people work and the and seeing what the effects of this tilted playing field are. Um, and I found that they were not just economic, but they're physical and emotional as well. And also that um, women of color and low wage workers are disproportionately affected. So um, the effects are really far reaching once you start looking into it. Yeah, and, um, and my next question is to explain how data visualization works, but also like with your work, because it's just a gorgeous installation, but there is meaning behind the portrait and all the pieces that are on the wall. So explain to us how, um, yeah, how the data visualization and how you created art with it. Okay, great. So the piece that we're looking at right now is called Amira. And the way my large scale sculptures work from my project, my project's called the Carrying Stones Project. And um, what I do is I collect real life work data from a diverse group of female identifying people um, who are willing to tell me what they do with their waking hours. So my project participants, like Amira in this case, uh, record their work hours, so they're paid and unpaid, and then anything else they do with their time in a custom timekeeping app that I built for the project. And then I translate, in this case, you know, the hours that Amira gave me into a sculpture that is a data visualization of her paid and unpaid hours. In this case, the, um, the darker leather forms are her paid hours and the wireframes are her unpaid hours because unpaid work is like less, less seen and less um, afforded less status in our society. And then once Amira's sculpture was finished. Um, I took the whole thing back to her and um, I took a portrait of her lifting and carrying the physical representation of, you know, so literally shouldering her burden in a real way. Um, and so, so that's how my data visualizations work. That, as you said, they're, um, you know, when you approach them, you might not know what you're looking at, but then once you see the face and read the wall text and understand this is a real person there in their life. Uh -huh. um, it's, it's, you know, hopefully poignant and resonates with you. Yeah, no, it certainly does. And I know we'll be doing a one-on-one -on -one video. So I encourage everyone to, um, it's for National Sculpture Day. We're gonna be highlighting Sawyer and her work. And also on the museum website, I wrote, a nice long blog about Sawyer and all her work. So I encourage everyone to read that. So thank you, Sawyer. And I will see you soon for the next videotaping. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Um, next, we have Lucky Rap. And as, um, as Lucky has said, you know, with her work, each one of these, the words and we rise is all to action to look within and push higher and close the gap and believe in oneself. Mm -hmm. So tell us, like with all the art fairs that you do, tell us your thoughts on inequities in the arts between male and female artists. Um, well, I think that's going to just keep continuing. So we have to just keep making work that's lucky. Um, speaking to that. So I feel like I try to use simple words to convey powerful mm -hmm. messages, but this inequity, I see it across all mm -hmm. platforms, you know? You're right, just not art. But I, what I love about your work is it's so it's so strong and so empowering. And I know you just returned, literally like just days ago, from a 30-day meditation course, and you do attend these several times a year. 
So how, how do you think this adds value to your creative process? And when you're in this silent meditation process, are you still thinking about your work or can you turn it off? And like, and, um, and what did you come up with? Well, the more advanced courses, so it's Vipassana and it's um, a silent meditation. So you meditate 12 hours a day. So for me, when I go in, I'm thinking of art constantly, just all art, art, art. So for me, it really helps me focus and I'm always distracted, always thinking about new projects, new word combinations. So as I go in, I have tons of ideas. And then as day 25, then I start, my mind gets a little bit more quiet, but it takes me about 25 days. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's a lot of time sitting on a cushion with uh, in front of a wall in the dark, so. Oh, yeah. I know. Wow. So so now, do you, when you got home, did you just do like a sort of a big like data dump into idea notebooks or for, you know, upcoming projects or what's yeah. next? I'm starting a, a big project in Menlo Park. It's called Springline and they gave me a whole building. So I've got three mm -hmm. floors that's going to be filled with um, all my artwork. So it's super challenging and I actually start installing that on Tuesday. So it was pretty wow. hard to stop thinking about that as well. You know, like all of a sudden I'm doing my first neon piece, which I'm really excited about uh, with Rebel Neon. So that's really fun. And then I, all of a sudden I thought, wait, my water drop should be the same color as the neon, which is called Neo Blue. So, you know, it's pretty hard for me to turn down the volume, you know, just all of a sudden go to a silent meditation, say, oh, now you have to be quiet, not think about that. Like my mind just doesn't work like that. So it's just good training, you know? Yeah. Well, congratulations. And where again is this and when does it open? Um, well, there's, oh, Springline? Yeah. Oh, Springline. I thought you meant my meditation. Um, yeah. It's in Menlo Park and it's a commercial real estate and retail development. And uh -huh. the, the project's almost finished, but um, I start on Tuesday doing uh, my building. There's a north building and a south building and then residentials and uh, units and everything like that. So I'm pretty excited about it. They gave me a great opportunity. Oh, that's excellent. Well, I'm definitely making a road trip to Menlo Park. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thanks for Thank including me in the show. It's been great. Thank you. Oh. And next, um, Roseanne Hermelin is not here today, was not able to attend. So I'm going to read for her with her piece, which is a um, installation with, um, uh, with umbrellas and cut um, plexi is Rise is an installation celebrating women and their aspirations to be more. Female figures ascend in the air, breaking away from confinement to rise beyond. Above each figure is a clear umbrella, or excuse me, <coughs> uh, symbolizing the glass ceiling. This invisible barrier has historically affected marginalized groups when advancing in their professions. The engraved, oh, sorry guys, I'm really having trouble in here. Mm. Pardon me. Um, the installation honors the many women leaders who are tearing down imposed limitations and obstacles built to define and divide differences. <coughs> the engraved Forbes uh, 100 Most Powerful Women list attests to this advancement. Okay, let's uh, move on to, um, to Jenny Reinhardt. I'm going to let you take the floor and okay. tell me three questions. What does call out the commands mean to you? And then tell us about the make me a sandwich. Okay. Okay. Um, so call out the commands um, from Rumi's poem, Split the Sack. And I, I came to a part in my life where I suddenly, the, the poem is basically a call to action for anybody to stop playing and get serious about your life, your creativity, and the incredible experience we have as human beings uh, on this on this earth. And I had it was a huge leap of faith for me to create large um, collages because I was pigeonholing myself into um, my my realistic background. Um, but there came an awakening, you know, where I thought, no, I, I had a huge studio suddenly at, with raw walls and I just didn't think little still lives felt relevant to me anymore. And it happened that this was at a point in my life where I was changing and I wanted to embrace a lot of the parts of myself that I had been suppressing 
Um, and it took a lot of courage. And uh, suddenly I was making giant collages and silk screens and they had a really intense feminist feeling um, that I have been suppressing all, all of that too. You know, I, I, I had suppressed a lot in my life. And this, this particular painting, um, I got a lot of courage out of this young woman who was 16 at the time that I did this painting. Her name's Jade Hamister. And she did uh, something called the polar hat trick where she skied through the North to the North Pole, the South Pole and across Greenland at age 16. And she was being trolled the whole time by men online saying, make me a sandwich, you belong in the kitchen. And I love this girl. She was in a pink parka with a fur collar and she um, did a Herculean feat. And then sort of snarkily at the end made a sandwich. And she did this photo op that her dad told me, he said, don't do that. It's a lot of expended energy, but she, there's this famous picture of her that's in black and white in the making a sandwich. And she said, it's ham and cheese, now ski, 600 kilometers in negative 30 degree weather and you can have it. And I felt as a 50 something year old woman, when I saw this young woman doing that, I felt so inspired and I was proud of myself for letting myself be inspired by someone younger than me. You know, you always tend to think, um, well, I have ge generational stereotypes too, you know, that, and so, this painting to me was just about women taking steps into their future, defining what they want. And even though I thought I was doing that, I was not. And so this period, I, I broke out of my old, um, you know, addictions and whatnot and started making new art. And I think it's way more powerful than my, you know, older art forms. Yeah, no, what I love about your work is it's so incredibly feminist and empowering and, um, <clears throat> you know, just really moving ahead. And I know that you're now, you know, working on your first uh, NFT project, which we'll have to save for another day, but that is just so exciting. But mainly it's Thanks. like, so I'm, I have one more artist who wasn't able to be here today, but I wanted to end with you just because I think you are just, you know, it's the epitome of like, just really showing, you know, femininity and agency and, um, and, and empowerment. Mm, and so, thank you so much. Here's my are, little, my little, like my Mary Jane project. And I can yeah. talk about it with anyone any other time. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And so now the last artist that we have, who unfortunately wasn't able to be here, but Alyssa uh, Eustachio and with her piece, Keep Feminism Fresh. And so simply, feminism should not leave a bad taste in one's mouth, but for many it does. Feminism has become an uncomfortable word. Those identifying with the label are seen as aggressive, unattractive, and anti-men. Placing the word on a stick of gum is my attempt to make the word palatable again, palatable again. And what we choose or choose not to consume can create change socially, politically, and economically. And then before we, I hope that we'll you know, have time to do some questions from the audience. I just wanted to say, um, you know, in conclusion, and I thank everybody so much for being here today is that um, activist art or artivism is a term for art that's grounded in the act of doing and it addresses political and social issues. In this show, these powerful works really reflect the lived experiences of the artists. And we need the historical correction for representation of women, non-binary and artists of color in the museum, gallery and art world at large. What is known, who is known and who gets their time in the sun. And I just have to say, I am so grateful to Jeff Nathanson, executive director of the Museum of Sonoma County for inviting me to be a guest curator and to the entire staff for making it happen. And also to my friend Connie Tell, the Feminist Art Project for collaborating with me on this timely and important exhibition. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to the audience 
to see um, if you have you know, any questions about the show or for specific artists and we'd love to answer them. So um, Lana, are you on here? Do we have any questions from people? They're in the chat, Karen. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? Um, uh, Connie, if you can see the questions, I would love for you to read them because I actually had to do this on my phone so I cannot see the, um, the comments. Sure. <clears throat> uh, the first one, um, let's see. You can do it from the chat or do it from the other side. Um, question from uh, Kathy Wintrack is, Jesse, do you think your work would be possible without feminist artists who came before you? Um, oh. Want to turn on your... Oh, you sorry. I, I responded to this question, but I'll just read my response. Um, of course, in my day to day life, I'm grateful and acknowledge all the feminists who came before me and I understand I have access to privileges and experiences that women before me did not because of them, but in regards to my artistic practice, I still do not feel any correlation to feminist art. My work is reflective of my experience as a queer person and as well as my interest in personal autonomy, self expression and technology. So in my day, day to day life, of course, but in my art, not necessarily. Hmm. Does anybody want to respond to that or comment? So the que what was the question again? It's like, does her... Um, I, or, well, she was asking, you know, because Jesse had said that, you know, she doesn't consider herself a feminist and that, you know, historically it doesn't relate to what she does. I'm just paraphrasing. You can please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and, you know, the question relates to respecting your elders and also knowing where you come from historically, even as a queer artist, would not happen if it wasn't for feminist artists coming before you. So I guess that was the way, that was the way it was. Yeah, I, I would say in, in a way, but you know, too, since actually we had to throw this out, Jesse is the niece of Sally Edelstein. So it's like, there's <laughs> no way she did, wasn't surrounded by all of this as you're, when you're growing up, but it's like, everybody has their own lived experience. And what I think is so important about the artwork in this exhibition is we have Joan Semmel, who is 90 and Jesse, I think you're 24. Yeah. And it was very different, like lived experiences and you're speaking from where you are. And mm -hmm. I think that's what the important thing is. And, of, um, and I would, never think you know someone you know disregards like what came before them but you have to make your own path and so that that would be my comment yeah that's what I said like I'm not I do acknowledge and like that's what I said in my day-to-day -day life like I'm obviously super grateful for all the women who came before me and I understand and acknowledge that but in, re in regards to my artwork I don't necessarily find the correlation personally but anyone can interpret my work in whatever way they want yeah. to but in yeah, thank you so much to the, for the person who wrote that question, because I think it's really a very good and important question. Anybody else want to comment or should I move on to the next? Yeah, I, I'd, like, I'd like to comment on that. Um, this is, this is uh, Delilah. Can and you turn on your video, Delilah? I believe so. Yeah, uh, did, yeah, here we go. I, you know, I'd like to, um, Kind of speak a little bit about that. I think that I think what we're seeing. I know when I was growing up. I know that when um, a lot of us were growing up, we couldn't step outside of our gender that easily. I mean, you just couldn't. You know, men in women's bathrooms, girls wear dresses, men wear boys wear pants. I mean, it was really clearly defined. Even if you know an individual didn't have that feeling. There was, there was no way of, of kind of like turning your back on it. And I think that what we're seeing, and I think it's, it's wonderful actually, this is the first generation, you're the first generation that can really speak to that, that can actually have taken the courage to step outside of your gender. In other words, out of this gendering that we're faced. And, and I, think it's, it's, I think it's really clear that, that gender is a spectrum. I think it always has been that. 
And, you know, I just really want to uh, kind of congratulate you for having the bravery to really put your finger on that, you know, and I think that's a truthism. It really is, you know, so, you know, I'm just celebrating you is what I'm doing. I'm saying like, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> okay. So I just, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. I, I agree. Too. I mean, Jess, it's like, it's like, this is the next step of, I think, where we were kind of heading as feminists is to be without gender, to have any definitions. And, and it's only maybe because we did come before that we sort of opened the door to that, mm -hmm. but you've gone to this place that we couldn't quite get to, which is, we, we applaud, which is fabulous. And I wish we could have gotten there too, but, but it only, it takes time. And so it's wonderful to see you do that. But, but you're on the same place that we are. We, you really are. like. This is kind of where we wanted to get to, like, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, Sally. Um, can Lana? Can we continue? Yeah. Um, the next question is: What is Cat Del Bono's? What are you working currently working on? And I believe there's another. Yeah. Did you um, already say that? I can't remember if you. No, but I'll just briefly, Karen had um, mentioned my voices project that focuses on domestic violence survivors. Yeah. <clears throat> and I just, I just want to say I'm very, very excited. I just got a Fulbright to go to Italy. So I'm doing a project that focuses on women in Italy, domestic violence survivors in Italy. So I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to do that. Because it was like, they had a ton of lockdowns during COVID, which really affected um, the number of women who were, you know, being abused and murdered even. So I'll be working on that. Great. Um, I'm not sure how we we're going to answer this question. It's pretty broad, but I'll read it anyway. I wanted to know if all of the artists consider this a movement that is going to grow. Do you all interact with one another and share ideas? And what do you see the future of this movement? Hmm. Anybody want to tackle that one in two sentences? Not so much. Jenny? Uh, yeah. Sure. I feel like um, this show is profoundly active in connecting people. It's a brilliant curation by Karen. And I feel like I'm personally so inspired by the the way she's brought all these people together and cannot wait to meet everybody and i know there's no, with no doubt in my mind that there are connections between us and when we when we meet they're going to inspire new ideas and we're going to bring those ideas home to our friends and family and um it just has a ripple effect out into the world and as long as we stay engaged and communicate with each other this helps grow our art and our and and it's exciting and it's fun so I think I would like to have this be part of a movement forever yeah and not not to like rain on anyone's parade but even though we've seen a lot of uh exhibitions recently where they they say you know like a woman who's you know 95 years old oh they just discovered her and <laughs> oh it's like we've been around all, the whole time we've been working been you know d d doing this and still uh d women it's you know the white cube gallery and museum scene is 85 percent white male 87 percent male and the rest is divided up amongst you know women and art you know artists of color so it's like there's still a lot of work to be done and so I've dedicated my practice to promoting you know this sort of art you know in order to you know to try and make a difference so um so nobody don't throw down the gauntlet yet there's still you know this is a triple marathon that we have to run I, I think there's also a, a sense of urgency politically. Um, excuse the growling in the background. Anyway, um, 
uh, because of what's happening in the world around, you know, what I had referred to earlier around the, 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 the voting situation, the rollback of voting rights, uh, the rollback of reproduction rights, the, the Supreme Court, um, and now globally, geopolitically what's happening. So I think, you know, we can't take any of this, these progressive gains that we've made over the last hundred years for granted. So I, I think there is a sense of urgency uh, around feminist issues, around global issues, and that might sort of light a fire under, uh, on, on, on the one hand that's going on, on the other hand, young, younger, the younger generation feels these freedoms. So, you know, there's these two uh, opposite directions that th things are going in, but I, I do feel that there is a sense of urgency in the world around uh, retaining and shoring up progressive gains. All right, Bonnie, let's, next question. Are there any? Yeah. Um, this is for Ria. Um, somebody asks, um, who has been one of your favorite Butch heroes to research? Um, that's an impossible question to answer, but um, I don't know. I like um, every one of them is kind of a different path. And when I think about that, I think about um, the first person that comes to mind was Okuhar Seiko, who was a Japanese artist. I connected with them mostly because they they were an artist and also a teacher. Um, and they find cat prints on their paintings, which is a very relatable experience for me. <laughs> um, and uh, then I think of Joe, who I just finished, who grew up in, in Idaho, which is where I grew up. And, um, or Lamacho from Mexico City was like Catholic, but super, super mischievous. And it was the first time I really got a sense of like a personality that I felt like I could really like be friends with if I if I got the chance, you know. So, just tons of I don't know. They're just all amazing folks. So I have a question for Karen. Mm -hmm. What criteria did you use to select the pieces that were put into this amazing show? This must have been quite a challenge. Congrats, very inspiring. From from Marianne. Oh, okay. Thanks, Marianne. Um, so the criteria. Well, first of all. Uh, you know, started working with the museum. And again, like, you know, it started, it was first going to be about voting rights. And then as it got pushed back because of COVID, we started more looking at, you know, the theme of agency. And so I have to say almost, I would say, <clears throat> I worked in the past with almost, I would say 90% of the artists in the show. So I was very familiar with their work. And this is like my 40th exhibition to date around there I think I've sort of lost count but um and so the curatorial process goes it's like you think of a theme and then you start researching and then asking some of the artists you know well like who else might they recommend and so and and Connie and I worked closely together with this where images that we printed out of all the work and keep going back and forth back and forth okay well if we have this person well then like not these two and and so it's um it's like putting a puzzle together and it's it's very 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 intuitive it's hard to explain but you just know it when the works they all speak to each other and they complement each other and they are all telling somewhat the same story but completely different in their own way and I hope I don't I hope that doesn't seem like obscure but but it's really, you know, the curatorial process is all about telling the story. And once you imbue yourself with the work and really study the work and all every single artist in this show has just a beautiful body of work, collection of work. So trying to choose, just pick just one piece from each artist was very challenging. But, um, but yeah, just at the end of the day, they just told an Amer uh, an amazing lyrical story together, and that and and then I I just pull them all together, and then and then it's just all the admin work of making it happen. 
and I have to say, let me tell all you artists, I am, I've been so happy and so pleased to work with all of you. It's just been such a joy and, and I really look forward to and the next show. Okay, we have one more, which is a very good question. What can you, and this is open to anybody. What can you say about the market, some parentheses, for feminist art today? So I guess we'd have to do a comparison of what it was like and what it's like today. Martha. There's a wonderful Gorilla Girl poster that was made in the 80s. And it basically lists 300 women artists whose work you could have bought in ex instead of the Jasper Johns that you just bought. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That was in the 80s, Martha. Okay, yeah. what would it that be like now? 80s. Yeah. Really. Okay. So now, <laughs> I, but it's not going to change them. It hasn't changed that much. Maybe two hundred. I don't know what Martha. What do you think? Do you think maybe we could buy two hundred for the price Jasper of Jasper Johns? <laughs> well, Jasper Johns versus well, Girls. Jasper Johns is still with us. <laughs> yeah, he's still selling for quite a lot of money. Uh, I don't know how many women artists would fit into a Jasper Johns today. Yeah. No, that, that is always the, the challenge because like I said before, you know, with the representation, it's like there's still, there's not any, it's not an equal playing field and it's this sort of uh, <clears throat> underlying, you know, biases of that, you know, the male artwork is inherently more value, valuable, which of course is absurd. Um, so we just have to keep fighting this good fight of, of being able to show this sort of artwork and, um, and, and change the general opinion. But um, I'd really love to hear from some of other artists, like what you think about this question. Um, I, I can speak a little bit to, um, I did this project with a young woman um, who's 25 in the NFT project and in the non-fungible token world, it was just an exploration for me to learn about that world. And it's almost entirely dominated by men. I think only 17% of this digital world of art is um, being used by women. And I don't know if that's because women are steered away from technology in this aspect, or they just aren't, you know, it's like a, a video game-esque thing, but um, I just think there are ways that women aren't brought into the conversation and we have to bring ourselves into that conversation. So with the new digital stuff, you know, I talk about it with my 80 year old friends and my 25 year old friends, and I want to make sure that we, you know, are relevant in that conversation so it doesn't escape, you know, this and, and it's completely an evil playing field. It's anonymous basically so women need to look into that in my opinion uh, delilah you wanted to say something you know i think that that question is kind of one that has been um kind of ongoing i know with the uh, latinx that's one of the things that we've been really kind of thinking about and, and looking at in terms of creating that kind of marketplace. So what we have to remember is that the male dominated art marketplace has had like centuries, literally centuries, right? To manifest itself and, 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 and making, you know, the museums and creating the industry and, 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 and doing all of these things. Whereas, you know, women and people of color you know, Latinx people, we've been excluded out of that market for so long, right? And so then the, the question is, is like, what do you do in order to like, turn that around, right? And, and I mean, there's like two ways of kind of like approaching this. One, you can do it by um, isolation. In other words, making your own markets. Right, and creating your own um, patron systems and your own museums and all of that. Or the other way of doing it is to integrate, 
right, into what, what's existing. And I think what, what we see is we see those two things kind of like, like working in tandem with each other. And in my estimation, I think you need the isolation first in order to, to kind of like bring that, you know, um, the peoples forward. In other words, where we begin to know that we can take that space. We can, we can move into that space, right? So that you have, you know, what do we need? We need the educators, we need the history, we need the curators, we need the, the patronage, right? We need the access collectors. into the museums, the collectors, all of that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's, I think it's a consorted effort of, of really going in there and, and taking that space, you know, literally just taking that space. You know, but it's easy said than done, right? Uh -huh. It's easy. Yeah, so, you know, so that, like I say, that's something that we've thought of. You know, I think we've all thought about that. And if you, if you go ahead. Oh, and I was gonna say, Sawyer, you have your hand up? Sawyer Rose? Yeah, hi. Um, hi. Well, you know, sort of, sort of my gig is to tell, to tell you what the numbers are. So if we're wondering what the status uh, is and what it was, I pulled, a, I, I did a whole piece on women in the arts and, and the status of all these things. And, you know, I just pulled it up and, you know, um, for, half of the visual artists in the United States are women and MFA programs are graduating over 50% of women and non-binary students. So like we're very well represented out there, but then when you look at like the outcomes, um, only 27% of 590 major exhibitions in the US from 2007 to 2013 were women. So 27%. Um, you know, permanent collections of 18 top art museums, 80% male, 85% white. Um, top 45 galleries in New York City, 6% are women of color. So, um, you know, if you're looking at the numbers, unfortunately, we have a lot of work to do. Not to be <laughs> the bearer of bad numerical news. Yes. So Connie, do we have any other questions or should we um, raise I think we could, Yeah, I think that's actually pretty much it. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone um, for participating. This was really, really awesome. Um, it was so great to hear from you. Um, and Karen, thank you so much for organizing this. Um, and I just wanted to mention a few things before we close. I'm gonna link right now um, the museum calendar in the chat for everyone um, so you can see the upcoming events. Like Karen mentioned, we have um, the, well, we're calling it the opening. We had to reschedule due to the um, surge in COVID cases, but we're going to have a reception for the exhibition on April 9th. Um, and so I hope everyone who is nearby can come to that, meet some of these lovely people in person. Um, and then we also have Karen herself is giving a tour on March 12th um, at 2 p.m., which is a Saturday, uh, in the gallery. So you can come check everything out in person um, and uh, hear from her directly. Oh, sorry, the, um, the reception is uh, starts at 5 p.m., um, but there is, and this is a, a free event for anyone who wants to come, but there is a ticketed um, preview before at 4 p.m. And I'll link that um, in the chat as well before we end. Um, and actually I can email everyone who's, who registered as well. So I'll email all this information to everyone so that you can have it in your email. Um, and then also we have uh, a, an excellent program uh, that is, will be happening uh, in April, April 27th, right, Connie? Maybe. Maybe, yeah, it's, it's a little TBD, um, but we're gonna have an amazing program called Feminists Are Funny, um, which is gonna be a night of stand-up comedy um, so please, please look at our website and uh, get on our mailing list so you get information about that because um, we will be sending out information and it'll be on our socials as well. Um, and then this, I just wanted to mention this exhibition is open right now. So it is open through June 5th. So you can come check it out at any point. Um, our hours are Wednesday through Sunday, 11 to 5. Please come to the museum. We've got some, some great exhibitions up um, in our history building as well. 
Um, and then we also have a, a great catalog um, that we have it. We have Karen. Uh, yeah, yeah, you want to hold it up? <laughs> there we go. It's beautiful and it's available for sale uh, here at the front desk. If you look, look at all the catalogs, that's nice. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so we just wanted to thank everyone again for, for viewing um, this panel and thank everyone for participating. Um, if you want to help us put on some more free programs, please feel free to donate to the museum. There was a link in the email that you got for the Zoom and there is also on our website. You can donate and we can keep on putting awesome free programs on. All right, so thank you so much to everyone. Yeah. Oh, and for one last thing, everyone. Did you, anyone get a glass to toast yeah. or I'll just y'all? The agency catalog is also available on Amazon Thank in addition to, uh, to the museum. But anyway, so here is to everyone. I toast you and here's to agency. Yes. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for all your, all your hard work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, amazing. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Museum of Sonoma County.